The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're going to turn back to ICOs and spend a little bit more time on initial coin offerings in the markets and the regulation of initial coin offerings today. Um, but, but before I did that, I was gonna talk about one short announcement that happened was in, this, in the US, we've talked about fiat currencies are accepted for taxes. Ohio. 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 James, what do you wanna tell me about Ohio? They're taking Bitcoin for taxes, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. What's that? So you want to say a little bit more about it, Hugo, or Ross? Go ahead. <laughs> sure, yeah, so they're, ta they're, they're accepting Bitcoin for taxes through BitPay, which means that it's instantly uh, transferred into fiat. But still, that's like a pretty big thing, you know? Yeah, so the state of Ohio, I guess it was the treasurer. Tom, you're shaking your head? Oh, that's Ohio, and just Ohio today breaks my heart. So I'm any, not related, but unrelated. So Ohio breaks your heart because they're accepting Bitcoin for taxes? Unrelated. Do you want to share for the class? Or? I'll let Governor DeWine in his next four years of policy speak for itself. Um, I see. So the state of Ohio has decided, announced the, the, the state treasurer. Is this an elected office, the state treasurer? So he saw that it would be good for Ohio for the economics and for the job creation in Ohio and maybe for his politics to uh, move forward and say the state of Ohio would accept Bitcoin for taxes. It's the only US jurisdiction that I know that has done that. Now you can think of them as a vendor, like they're saying they'll take it, and they've arranged it, as Hugo said, through uh, BitPay. BitPay is an application where whether you're Starbucks or the state of Ohio, um, that you can take a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and they will uh, take that Bitcoin, sell it quickly on an exchange, take some price risk, BitPay takes a little bit of price risk, and for a 1% fee, give you fiat currency. Now it's 1% and whatever exchange rate, because I don't know how much a VIG or margin is in the exchange rate transaction, but but their stated fee is one percent. Hugo, I think the big question is whether or not that's a taxable event. Too. Is it a taxable event for who? For the person who's paying their taxes in Bitcoin. If any transaction for Bitcoin, yeah, it's a taxable event. All right. So Hugo has raised the question: Is the sale of the Bitcoin to fiat because the fiat is in essence? being used to pay the state of Ohio taxes, is the sale of that Bitcoin a taxable event? And I think somebody in the class will know. It, 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 well, it's so it's knowable. If you sold Bitcoin to acquire fiat, it would be. But if you use fiat to acquire Bitcoin, which I think the big application here is the marijuana industry in Ohio, because they're not able to act as bank system, if they're acquiring Bitcoins and then paying them to the government, they don't have to pay taxes. What if you bought Bitcoin at thirty-seven hundred, and the day that you sent in your taxes, it's valued at thirty-eight hundred Bitcoin? Yeah, you pay taxes on the profit. That's correct. So, so, so the, at least here in the U.S., the U.S. the IRS has spoken to this. If you acquire Bitcoin and then you use the Bitcoin in commerce, if you you're using it to fulfill an obligation, and that's, in this case, a debt to the Ohio government. And if it moved from 3,700 to 3,800, you would, yes, you would have a short-term capital gains on the $100 difference. Um, whether everybody will comply and report properly is another thing, but that, that is that's certainly my reading of uh, US law at this time. Ross. It's cons it, this re I saw this and I looked up a couple of things. It strikes me it would be taxable given what you've said about the US thing. And it really is just changing it for fiat. It's just a it's just a structure, really. But what what might make it seem more um, interesting or gain a little traction is if 
Ohio, if they have a state income tax, agreed not to tax the game. Ohio could agree not to do it. You still have to pay on the federal side. But then they could make it more like a real transaction that you're paying in Bitcoin. And, and, and how many people are from Ohio here other than Tom? Tom? As an Ohioan, would you want them to not charge the taxes? You're one voter, I know. So this, well, I, I don't vote there anymore. Oh, you're not vote there. So they charge a state income tax, but I don't know if they charge a state capital. But that's the quick. But I'm just saying that's how they could make it more real than, like Hugo was saying, it's not real right now. We're just converting it to dollars and taking the dollars. They did, in this announcement, if you read the fine print as I was wont to do, because I was fascinated by this, um, for the first three months of the program, Ohio negotiated with BitPay that BitPay would charge 0% fee for the first three months. But this was BitPay foregoing it appears that that was their, you know, their their bonus to the state of Ohio, zero uh, percent fee for three months. Again, not knowing exactly what exchange rate you're getting, uh, and so forth. Um, and and you think it would be the cannabis industry? Yeah. So Ohio passed a uh, state constitutional amendment two years ago. We're talking about Ohio that's now accepting Bitcoin for taxes. And Tom is a resident of Ohio expert. expert. I guess so. Is so yeah, the Ohio uh, will legalize. The state voters passed an amendment to allow the marijuana marijuana legalization, subject to I think some time delay or regulatory approval. But the expectation is that it will be approved, and that the marijuana industry is still restricted from accessing the federal banking system. So an alternate way for them to avoid carrying large sums of cash. Just carry the value in, in cryptocurrency. Yeah. And do you think that's what motivated the Ohio State Treasurer? Yeah. I see. Sean. I was, I was just curious. So if that's the case, and if I, if I make, well, we're talking about capital gains, but if we include losses on Bitcoin, does that part of loss get carried forward that allows you to offset some of your income? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, a cap capital loss. But just as if you bought Apple stock and had a loss on Apple stock. So it cannot be careful but, uh, to offset the, uh, the future. Yeah. Yeah. Under U.S. law, I can't speak to other jurisdictions' tax, but you, you can apply losses against gains. And to the extent you have greater losses than gains, you can actually take some of those losses against your income. I don't remember the limit any longer. It's... Uh, Three three thousand U.S. dollars, and then otherwise carry it forward. Uh, so, uh, for most citizens, uh, they would just take that loss. If, if you had greater than that, you'd carry it forward. Any other thoughts on Ohio? I mean, yeah, I'm just wondering, sort of philosophically, if Ohio isn't actually carrying the price was like given that they're converting it to fiat instantaneously. Are they really accept? Like philosophically, are they really accepting? Uh, Bitcoin as payment for taxes, um, or is it just a marketing? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, what would, would any other views on that? So the question is: Is Ohio really taking cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, or is it just marketing? Okay. Uh, I think it's marketing because if if you had BitPay, the whole point of BitPay is to turn it back into fiat. So, which is why I think they can pay taxes on it. Uh, if if the state of Ohio had a wallet. Bitcoin, and they would accept those Bitcoins into their wallet and hold those proceedings in their wallet, then they would be formally accepting Bitcoin for taxes, and you will not need to pay uh, taxes on that transaction. And, and I, I would, but I would raise the question: What's the rel? With all respect, what's the relevance? Why does it matter to a to a taxpayer in Ohio? If this facilitates my paying my taxes, whether it's in the cannabis trade or some other trade, they're facilitating another means of paying my taxes, fulfilling my obligation to society. Yeah. So my response to that would be, you know, in, in how we define what a currency is, and one of those, uh, you know, criteria is are they accepted uh, to pay taxes? I think it's, it's relevant to that distinction. Yeah. Tom, do you want to defend your fellow Ohioans? No. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think it's relevant. I mean, 
the Ohio State Treasurer doesn't take bellies or cotton or even corn as you know payment for taxes. I don't know if they take gold. No, uh, uh, to my best of my knowledge, no. Yeah. So even for the short term transfer, I think it's relevant. So, so it's a bit of a hybrid, I guess, is what Tom's saying. Um, Ross, I'm not. It's there's a real question about whether they could take it directly for taxes, because under the Constitution, the states cannot make anything legal tender. Only the federal government can make that determination. Only the federal government can establish legal tender, not the states, other than gold. No. So, so there would actually be a question about whether Ohio could, who would object is another question, but it's an issue. What they're doing is marketing, I think, but they could, for example. Though I, I, um, I, I'm not studied in the law of legal tender. I could see a, a, a case that says, this is not making it legal tender. This is just saying you can pay your taxes in another form of property. Um, you know, does that make it legal tender? No, it just makes it that we, the government of Ohio, will accept it for taxes. But it doesn't mean that we are saying that Starbucks has to take it for a cup of coffee. I also see it as a gateway as taking it in a few years, uh, having their own wallet. So like testing it out, see how many people actually use it. And if they want to eventually avoid the fees of the processing service, they could eventually rule that out if it, if it, they set it as a precedent now and whether or not they're converting it immediately doesn't really have an effect as to whether it sets the precedent for future uh, years to actually use it as a right. medium in their, uh, as their own wallet as they want. I mean, and they might just be testing it out, James. I guess reverting to Ross's point, the legal tender, the money is different, right? So the criteria here, we're talking money, you can pay taxes, which in this case, I think this is submerging onto the hybrid situation where it's not a cow, it's not some corn, but it certainly can pay tax, uh, the taxes via a particular means. So it kind of make it more and more like money, whether or not it's legal tender, that's, uh, that's money to uh, 2.0. Yeah, I think Which it's an interesting, interesting question of whether, yeah, it's a high, right. whether you can get to a hybrid using this. I, I agree with that. Yeah. And they're testing it out. And maybe the state treasurer feels that it's good for his politics. It will appeal to some portion of the electorate, whether it's millennials, whether it's Bitcoin maximalist, whether it's the cannabis trade, uh, I, or maybe he just looks more tech savvy that he can put an announcement saying, we are the only state in the land. Um, uh, the website says that uh, they're promoting it to, uh, to lower fees. That uh, Now, I don't know how many people would pay their taxes in Ohio using the credit card rails, but literally on the website they talk about, well, this is lower fees than the 2.5 or 3% you get charged from your credit cards. But I think that that would only be a very small portion of taxpayers um, and they're accepting it for sales tax. They're accepting it for all forms of tax. It's not just income tax. So it's all the small transactional taxes as well uh, uh, as, as income tax and real estate tax. You know, it's just an uh, interesting thing. Jake? So what's the actual benefit? Because can't they just go sell the Bitcoin on the market and pay the tax in cash? So it's benefit for, for, the for the taxpayer? It's, it's a good question. What's the benefit for the taxpayer? Uh, uh, it's the same question as what's the benefit for any consumer if I want to use Bitcoin maybe to buy a Starbucks? Uh, so any vendor could say, we'll accept Bitcoin here. Um, the benefit for the consumer or taxpayer is if they find it more convenient, if it's lower fees, if this is where they're storing their value rather than fiat. Not many people uh, are, but that would be. And maybe, maybe as, as Tom pointed out, that there's a specific idiosyncratic thing in Ohio that they've just moved forward. And have they legalized uh, marijuana trade in Ohio? Uh, I don't think it's fully legalized. It's been like authorized to be legalized, but I don't think the drug that they so they're in the process, and Tom has a theory that 
Maybe there's some that can't access the banking system. Or the fiat, in essence, they're, they're off fiat rails. So here's a, at least Tom's theory of the case. Um, so those might be some of the, anyway, so what else happened in the last week, by the way, since we came together? Anything else in the crypto space? 30% drop in Bitcoin. 30% 30, 30 drop. I haven't checked recently, but yeah. Um, do you have any theories on that before we go to crypto exchanges and ICOs and everything? <laughs> Not that come up. No, no, no theories. Oh, well, Brodish. We haven't heard from Brodish. You have a theory? <laughs> Theory as to the 30% drop since we were last together. I had a different point about what happened recently. We saw the news article about BACT uh, mm -hmm. postponing their launch of the Bitcoin future to February, which was supposed to happen in November. Do you think that was because they were here to talk with us? I mean, your questions were good. Uh, uh, do you have any views on uh, Sean? We'll come back to the BACT. Uh, because of the hot point, there was a hot point that happened last Saturday, uh, a, a week ago on Bitcoin Cash, and then people kind of uh, caused kind of the skepticism in the market to say like, which is going to be the majority kind of the, the consensus for for, for for the currency. So, so there was a there was a hard fork in Bitcoin Cash. The Bitcoin Cash split into yet Bitcoin Cash, and is it now come settled as Bitcoin S V S? What's that? Satoshi's vision. Satoshi's vision. Is it so SV? Um, uh, I couldn't make this stuff up. Um, uh, but but that hard fork was timing wise right at the center of a break in the markets. But uh, I, and so there's some that have written well. Is that the reason? Um, uh, I've been around markets long enough to think that might be a, a news event, but I don't think that was the reason there was such a softness in demand that a news event like that comes along and then market breaks and finds no support. You know, it just it drops from what was it around 6,300 to all the way through to 37 or 3,800. I don't know where it's trading right now, but it's somewhere in that range. I'm sorry. 3714. The Ohioan has spoken. 3714. Um, so yeah, th that type of not finding a price support. There's other reasons. I I would I would think, um, which really goes back to the heart and soul of valuation. Yes. So what about uh, we were talking about taxability earlier? It is approaching December, so tax loss selling. For people in taxable right. So maybe tax loss selling. Mm -hmm. There was something in the news about Visa and MasterCard banning anything related to cryptocurrencies and initial coin offering. So any transaction related mm -hmm. to them. So there was something in the news about it. There is also news, which we're going to review today, that the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, uh, took two additional actions in the initial coin offering space. But these actions um, were a little different than the past actions. So they've already taken about a dozen uh, enforcement actions or settlements or orders in the initial coin offering space. But these two, Paragon and um, Airfox, um, uh, were different in that one, uh, they weren't you know, uh, surrounded by obvious scam or fraud. Uh, I'm not going to speak to their motivations, but they were more traditional, 12, 15, 18 million dollars raised in each of them uh, situations. Two, they're about a year old, and here they are finally coming to a settlement where the uh, entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists behind it said, um, all right, we get it. We're going to come into compliance. We're going to do an offering statement. We're going to put out the, the full and fair information about this, but also we're going to be willing to um, uh, give back money, you know, to people who were. Um, so they're not fighting in the court. So some have gone into court against the SEC, 
But here also the other thing was the first time they paid penalties. I think they were modest, relatively modest, quarter million dollars if I saw. Um, but that also happened in the midst of this. You know, so the, the SEC for the first time actually assessed penalties, had settlements. They were also not the sort of clear, obvious scam and fraud cases. They were simply, hey, you didn't register and you were supposed to register. You're in essence uh, an illegal securities offering, but now come into compliance, pay a penalty, move forward um, as well. So. Um, a lot going on. So today uh, we already did Ohio, which was uh, more fun than the rest of this stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about the Howey test again, which we talked about about a month ago, but I wanted to bring it back into the discussion about initial coin offerings. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some realities. Ernst & Young put out a recent report that wasn't in your readings. It just came out last week, but I want to review some of the findings that Ernst & Young did on um, what they call the class of 2017. They look at the top 140 ICOs from 2017 and where are they as of the end of September of this year, uh, not even speaking about the last uh, six or eight weeks. Um, some SEC enforcement actions I, I want to walk through just to give you a flavor for at least this country's approach to initial coin offerings, how you can actually comply with securities law uh, I promise you that I'm not going to go deep diving, and, and, uh, but I want to give you a little bit of a flavor for uh, how to actually, if you were to be involved in an initial coin offer and how to do it in a compliant way, and some personal thoughts on the path forward um, uh, in ICO land. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, the study questions um, we'll get to, but... Um, I just want to ask the class, the middle, the middle question, which is the, is the easiest, is, or maybe the hardest, why is this market so rife with scams and fraud? Whether it's Christian Catalini's work that said 25% of the market or this smaller sur survey status group that was part of today's readings up to 80%. Why do you think this market has so many scams? Aline, what do you want to you? It's so easy, come on. <laughs> What's easy? The question's easy or the getting scamming the market's easy? Scam people. Like, why wouldn't you do it? It's so damn easy. <laughs> I'm sorry. The first part I got, remember we're on video. <laughs> All right. It's a, it's a rhetorical question. It's, it's a rhetorical question. It's so easy. Uh, and thus, it's easy for bad actors. JP. I thought there were like two main reasons. One is because it's such a new thing, there is like lack of kind of the regulatory environment um, that like, you know, that happens with the IPO and other like uh, ways of raising funds. And I think the second one is it's as like Aline pointed out, I think it's very easy to just go through like go say I'm going to do ICO when there's only an idea. Um, so I think that's why a lot of investors like, or like consumers just fall into the scams and fraud. And I think you have, um, I mean, the fact that you're just publishing a white paper that no one, no one actually is interacting with you unless it's on a blog or something like that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're publishing a white paper that could have this grandiose idea and then all of a sudden they just, they just run and there's really nothing stopping them from doing that. Um, so I, it's, it's just so, difficult. So, so I've heard it's easy. It's not yet in a regulatory space. It's, it's, it's at a distance. It's just a publishing of a white paper. And there's simply demand because of the and media. So demand. Yeah, there's just a lot of demand with the media around Bitcoin going up towards 20,000 last year. There's demand to get in, get into the bottom of, of one of these ICOs to hope to get the same kind of return. So there's tremendous demand and related to demand, uh, you know, fear of missing out. So whether it's greed, it, you know, the animal spirits, the human spirits of markets around fear and greed. So the greed of participating or the fear of missing out was certainly part of late 2017 and into uh, 2018. Kelly. Talk a little bit more about what Gigi said about the lack of the regulatory environment that sort of leads to because, you know, a lot of these ICOs are not in compliance with securities acts and regulations that allows them to sort of skirmish around investor protection so investors don't necessarily they're not necessarily privy to material information about 
the financing and what they might reasonably expect as a return. So it kind of right. They're just taking advantage of a little. I agree, but I think at the court, Kelly's t touching on one other thing. Jerome. I, I have one question, and is the scams are defined as a company that you can no longer reach or see if they came out with a product. But I was wondering, given that this is a very early stage venture, how much is really people who maliciously run away with the money or that just tried something and, and failed? Right? They just raise money. Try it or, and because they did it with a PowerPoint, they realized it's not going to be a good business case and they just abandoned it. Right. Not as a scam, but as a, a, a new venture. I, that they, uh, I, I think Jeremy raises the right question. It's why one study says it's 5 to 25% scams or frauds, and another study says 80%. It's what, what's in the definition. A good faith actor could say this is easy money. A good faith actor could say, this is cheap money. I can raise money fast just on the backs of a white paper um, in the middle of a bull market, a, a, a maybe even a bubble, um, and then find out three months later that their idea doesn't work out. And the, I, I, I accept that there are probably a lot of good faith actors that raised tens of millions of dollars. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily personally call that a scam, but nonetheless, somebody else might call that a scam. So Telegram raised $1.7 billion in February of this year. I don't know, has, uh, how many people have ever read the white paper? I mean, not that it was ever a sign, but all right, all right. So, all right, I've read the white paper. I couldn't figure out in February when they raised the money what they were going to use that $1.7 billion for. No, it's a remarkable technology, and they have, I think, somewhere around 200 million users in their non-blockchain use. And so they were able to raise a lot of money with a lot of fancy words, but they still haven't gone live. They haven't taken the 1.7 billion and created a network. Filecoin, that I, I, it seemed to be, a good faith concept about using a token to motivate the ch exchange of, of file storage. Assume for a moment it's good faith actors. They raised the money in October of 2017. It's 13 months later. They still do not have a live network. And they've announced uh, the latest announcements is it will come either in the first or second quarter of 2019. Some people might call that a scam, I'm, I wouldn't, but so I think you're right. There's a range of, of activity. Um, but there's one other thing about why I think this has been an easy place for scams and frauds, and it's the technical nature of it as well. Like I hope at the end of this class, whatever you think of the lectures, whatever you think of the assignments, you come away with some critical reasoning skills <laughs> that the 80 or so of you who have you know, been on this journey together, we'll, we'll leave and say, all right, I get it. But for most, for the hundreds of thousands or even millions of people that have invested, uh, th th there's a lot of technical, you know, whether it's hash functions or digital signatures or, you know, and so um, I think it's easier to scam the public when it's shrouded in jargon. And so maybe it's a, it's a lesson for all of us to always be careful about our own investments when something is shrouded in jargon. And it doesn't have to be cryptographic jargon. It could be other types of jargon as well. I think that's also a, one of the reasons why it's been easier to kind of scam and fleece the public in the midst of a bubble, in the midst of a non-regulated space, in the midst of just throw a white paper up. Um, that's also a nature of it just being we're investing at such an early stage. So like plenty of tech that ends up IPOing and has public investors when it's early on, it's only you know, VCs investing and they understand the tech, but you don't have like regular consumer retail investors actually putting money into those really early stage companies. Where with ICOs, we're investing at the white paper. So it's you know, regardless of whether it's blockchain or robotics company or whatever, it's it is very confusing that early on. Right. Right.
Right, so it's also very early stage investing, which is a good point. Um, so uh, I'm gonna skip over the reading. So investor protection, I found at a conference uh, in, in, in uh, Paris, an OECD conference, we got into a debate and there were, there were regulators, I was not a regulator at the time, this was earlier this year, regulators from 30 or 40 countries and we got into a debate of what's the difference between investor protection and consumer protection. And so these are just some thoughts, but investor protection, which has been the hallmark of the US markets since the 1930s and in other jurisdictions, other decades, it's been adopted, I think is part of why the US capital markets were really at the forefront of this incredible economy for 70 or 80 years here in the US, and it's helped other economies subsequently. But it's four big things. Investors do take risk but they get full and fair disclosure from an issuer. And there's a concept that there's asymmetric knowledge. That an issuer has a bunch of information and an investor does not. Through the laws of the land, can we balance that a little bit? Investors still have every opportunity to take risk, but can we address the asymmetry of information? And that's, the, that's a really a core part of investor protection, a little bit different than consumer protection. You still wanna be protected that a crib that you buy isn't not gonna hurt your child or that the clothing you put on an infant doesn't, isn't instantly flammable. Those are important consumer protections and often we protect them in the laws as well. But information asymmetry and the difference between information between an issuer, somebody raising money and an investor is something we try to embed in securities laws around the globe. Two is the, the concept of sales practices. Various fraud and sales practices are prohibited. Sometimes you hear this around securities laws about the marketing information, what information you need to, to provide. So the first and second are principles that go into why there's information statements or securities offerings come with all of that boilerplate. And sometimes it's, you might say it's too much, uh, but, but all of that is to address information asymmetries and try to lessen or make it harder to have fraud and deceptive practices. Then we have something called secondary markets where buyers and sellers meet, like on the New York Stock Exchange or on a crypto exchange. And the concept being, um, can we promote market integrity? Can we promote those markets by either through transparency? Transparency is really being able to see what buy orders and sell orders, what's the, what's the, what's the price that people are willing to pay, what's the amount they're willing to buy or sell. So pre-trade transparency, it says, I'm gonna share in the marketplace that there's not somebody over here, some high frequency traders that get transparency, but retail public does not get transparency. You know, that, that, that brings it into one market. And some rules against manipulation. Now the word manipulate, one person's manipulations, another person's market practice. I, I, I respect that, that too, just like the word scam. But there's traditional things about manipulation that have come to be, you know, we should, we should forbid certain practices. Front running is one where a customer gives you a sell order and you say, well, the customer's sell order, good, I'll sell in front of them because I know that when they sell, it's gonna push the, it's gonna be uh, market pressure, either uh, up, up pressure with a buy order or down pressure with a sell order. Um, so one is address asymmetries through information prohibit or limit fraud and deceptive sales practices and marketing, lying sort of, promote the integrity of the secondary markets through first price transparency and secondly, anti-manipulation. And then lastly, recognizing that all financial markets have conflicts and we are not gonna repeal conflicts. Anytime any one of you goes to a broker, that broker does want you to transact so that they earn more money. But by the way, when you sit down at a restaurant and they ask you if you want a drink before you order, there's a bit of a conflict too. They want you to buy the drink because your tip amount is, is a percent of, of your final 
bill. Or, well, in most countries, I can't speak for every country here. Um, but in finance, those conflicts are so evident that there are sets of rules, usually that, usually that promote some transparency that you know what the advisor is getting, but some practices are prohibited. So these are kind of some of the core things that at least uh, I think are embedded as concepts in our securities laws, and, and not just here in the US, but, but around the globe. Any questions on that before Brodish? So on the first point, like if we are saying that we have some sort of a minimum disclosure requirement for ICOs, uh, do you think like in this kind of a field, we have the like the regulators will have the expertise to judge whether those requirements are met or not? Like they can say that you are you asking whether the investors will have the expertise or the regulators? It's a good question. I think that. Um, the concept is, is that issuers should share a certain level of material information with potential investors, and then investors assess the risk. Not that the regulator assesses the risk, but the investors. So the question is, what is material, and what needs to be shared in what readable fashion? And maybe it's the case in this, this ecosystem this, that the information should be a little different. Historically, you'd have to share three years of financials or two years of financials. But what do financials mean if it's a new concept, a new idea? Um, so I, I, I think you raise a good point that it, it might need to shift a little bit. But the core concept is, is that the material information to make an investment decision should be shared and then investors have an opportunity to assess that risk. And you're right, the regulators are less experienced in this space to say what is a material bit of information beyond who here's the, the team and here's the concept. Um, um, the Howie test. So there was an individual in Florida. He ran for governor twice in Florida and lost twice, just a little background, William Howie. Uh, he was also very successful in real estate and he had a hotel and he had a, something called Howie on the Hills and he started buying a bunch of land and then he thought, well, I'll sell some of the land and, and, and grow oranges, orange groves. And when he sold the land, he, op he gave the opportunity to investors in the land to enter into a separate contract with a company he had, but it was not required. You could buy the land, you know, an acre three acres, but he said, if you want, you can enter into a contract with my affiliate, Howie on the Hills, I think was the affiliate as well, but, and we'll grow your oranges for you and give you the, uh, the, the revenues from growing the oranges. So the question, uh, there was a new law in the US in the 1930s. He was doing this in the late 1930s. And the new law was called the securities laws of 33 and 34. The question was, was what William Howey was doing, and then he passed away, was his, his estate, what they were doing, um, a security under the US securities law. Well, in the US, the word security was defined by our Congress to include equity, bonds, options, and there was a comma and said investment contracts. So the real question was, what was the definition of this two words, investment contracts? In 1946, it went to our US Supreme Court, and this was the four-part test. And this four-part test has gone back to the US Supreme Court three or four times since then. And it's been affirmed every time, in the Edwards case and other cases and so forth, over 70 years. It, this same four-part test went to the Taiwanese High Court in 2011, and they adopted it. I don't know enough about Taiwan law, but it was adopted in Taiwan in 2011, and it's, it, the similar test is in Canada. So there's three jurisdictions that basically have this. Is it an investment of money or assets? Is it investment in a common enterprise? Do you have a reasonable expectation of profits? And is it based on the efforts of others? So they determined that William Howey and then his, 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 um, his estate afterwards was basically a common enterprise growing all these oranges. And so it was the expectation of profits. 
That's the Howey test. Um, I've talked to you before about the duck test, but when, when I see an investment that walks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, I call that investment a security in a way. But that's really it, you know, using your common sense. Ethereum, when it was first promoted in 2014, I believe passed this test. And the word pass means that you are a security, the, the, just a little vocabulary thing. You want to fail the Howey test, by the way. Like if you are a venture capitalist you, 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 and don't want to be regulated, you want to fail this test. But to pass the Howey test, Ethereum in 2014 exchanged Bitcoin for ETH. Um, it was an investment in a common enterprise at that point in time, a 20 or 21 year old Vitalik Buterin running a S Ethereum foundation out of Switzerland. It was, it was one group, um, an expectation of profits. They had no functioning network. It was just an idea in a white paper, a really good idea and good faith actors. Uh, and it was reliant on whether Vitalik and his, you know, team of coders were going to stand this project up. I mean, to me, I don't even think there's much doubt what this was in 2014 when they raised the $18 million. Now, it was the largest ICO done at the time. There hadn't been anything of its size at $18 million. And our U.S. securities uh, agency and others around the globe really weren't looking and watching until the Dow happened in 20. 16 and raised 160 or so million. And then that sort of caught the attention. So regulators start to wake up uh, and, and think about it after that. Um, so initial coin offerings, we've already talked about this, but it, it, the proceeds are used to build networks and purchasers anticipate profits through appreciation. So that's like the core of the Howey test. Now, some jurisdictions don't have the Howey test, and some jurisdictions don't have those two words in the definition of security, investment, contract. So I actually think in a lot of jurisdictions, an, an initial coin offering may not be a security because it's not defined in their, their statutes. It's not some legislative body like ours in the 1930s included it in a definition. But I believe if this market were to grow, and it might not grow, but if it were to grow, other countries might want to address that and change their statutory language because investors still have an asymmetry and could benefit with more disclosure. Um, as we've talked about, the tokens are usually prior to being functional. What was the statistic? Does anybody remember? How many in the la in third quarter of 2018, what was the percent that was functional? Anybody? What's that, Alpha? 5%? You're a little high. <laughs> yeah, 1.4%. 1.37% was fully ready product. Or 1.7 was code, so we'll, we'll round up. But 76% were on ideas. And this is in the third quarter of 2018 uh, by Crypto Compare. And here are some large tokens that uh, offerings that have yet to go live. And I just picked five really big ones. That doesn't mean that all big ones haven't gone live, but uh, you were asking me about Filecoin in our last class. Uh, I think Filecoin, if I went back and I looked at the white paper, I've looked at a lot of things about Filecoin since last Tuesday. Filecoin is basically a coin that says you can use this coin when we go live uh, which hopefully will be by the second quarter of 19, to buy file storage from others that are on the network. Their business model, Filecoin sold 10% of the token. So if it was truly worth 257 million at the time, they in essence had a total value of two and a half billion. Uh, some of the tokens were kept by the company, some of the tokens were kept by founders, but it in essence capitalized the total stock at 10 times that. So in that model, 
they, uh, the usage of the coin was amongst the community. To answer, I think that was a question you asked me to go back. But that's not the case for every ICO. There's two stark variations. One is one where you use the token to buy a good or service from a service provider. Let's, in the case of Filecoin, say it's directly from Filecoin. Or you use the token to buy a good or service from other people in the community. The Filecoin white paper suggests, it's a year since they wrote it, <laughs> that it's, it's a token to be used amongst the community. Um, which I think was your, it's a little confusing because they haven't gone live. We don't really know. Hugo. I have a question about Ripple. Um, yes. And if you have any opinion on whether XRP is a security that was <laughs> sold by Ripple or currently continuing to be sold by Ripple as they own like 55 billion of the coins. Um, because also like, their product, on, like what they want XRP to be used on, XRapid, isn't really live. XCurrent is the thing that they're using most, most right now, and that's just an alternative for Swift that doesn't even use their coin. So, so Hugo has asked about uh, the token XRP and whether I think it's a non-compliant security. I've spoken publicly. Yes, I do think it's a non-compliant security. Um, but this will not be resolved just by the Securities and Exchange Commission. It will be resolved by some courts, whether it's appellate courts or the Supreme Court. So what I believe is just that. It's a belief. But why would I say that? Um, I think back to the Howey test. I think they are exchanging XRP. Ripple, the company, is exchanging XRP for something of value. And they're using it right now. They sell it every month. It's in a lockup. There's in an escrow. And they sell uh, XRP every month. Ripple, the company, uh, initially did the Genesis block back in 2013, but kept 80% of the tokens. Now they have about 60% of the token. Um, but they sell it on a continuous bit, 100 million to 200 million or so a month of, of value. Uh, two, I think it is relying on a common enterprise. I think Ripple, the company, XRP investors are very much relying on Ripple, the company. Uh, and that if Ripple, the company went away, as you noted, there's not much use of XRP. In fact, for the first three or four years, uh, uh, or five years even, there was no use. And then they prototyped something called X, um, X Rapid. Uh, X current, the main product of Ripple, the company, is a messaging and, and, a, and, a, and a, a, apparently a clever one that's competing with Swift. But X um, Rapid, the prototype, uh, uh, doesn't have a, a large community right now. So it's highly uh, centralized around Ripple, the company, the development, the node network. The ownership is 55 or 60 percent owned by them. Uh, they're, they're promoting it as such. But it will be it will be settled in some court at some point in time. And there might be regulatory forbearance and maybe it will be determined not to be. But I've I've expressed my thoughts. Uh, I don't own any of this stuff. I don't have any particular conflict. I'm just speaking as I believe. Catalina. Uh, regarding how do you determine where the ICO took place? Like where what? Where the ICO took took place? Where what is the jurisdiction? Like which will be the regulator and if they are under the laws of the U.S. or everywhere else because the blockchain is universal. No, it's a very good question. So jurisdiction. When when does any country have jurisdiction? Or maybe I should ask it differently. When do you think countries try to exert their jurisdiction in the context of capital markets. We're not talking about the context of, of, of uh, consumable goods, but in, in terms of the capital markets, where do jurisdictions usually exert their jurisdiction? I think the issue here uh, to the which uh, investor uh, will be take their uh, the ITO. Okay. The majority of the investor will be a U.S. person, so it should be a U.S. regulator handle this.
So, so one approach theory is it's where the investors are, and you even use the word a majority of investors, or just where the investors are. Yeah, that's good. All right. So there's all right. So where the investors are, and then the question is how many investors: minority, majority, de minimis, so forth. Uh, another point of view. Any just counter? Where the company was incorporated. All right. So where the company's legal jurisdiction is. Maybe the company's incorporated somewhere. So in essence, where the issuer is. And there's a third one. Tax consideration. What's that? Tax consideration. Tax considerations. Can you, you know, can you collect taxes? Where the team is physically located. Where the what? Where the team is physically The team, the physical team. So you might legally incorporate in the Cayman Islands, but your executive team might be in New York or in Beijing. Um, um, and, and the one other, which I think all of these go in, the exchange. The exchange. All right. The secondary markets. So all of these things somehow influence uh, the concept of jurisdiction. And there's various laws, and each country has their own different. I, I'm not going to do a whole review of this, uh, but usually countries want to exert their jurisdiction if if their citizens and somehow are affected, or if their tax base is, accept, is somehow affected. So um, in the US securities laws, if it's affecting US citizens, or if the exchange or secondary markets are in our physical jurisdiction in the 50 states and so forth, um, or the issuer, so it's all three of these, often there's some exertion of jurisdiction and, and, it's, and it's upheld in the courts. And then you get to some issuers have to deal with multiple jurisdictions. And almost every large corporation that has investors in multiple jurisdictions has to deal with the investor laws in multiple jurisdictions. So initial coin offerings, if they want to tap into US 328 million people to buy some of these, more than a de minimis, it's not a majority. US law doesn't need a majority. It just has to be more than a handful. Um, there'll be uh, US Securities and Exchange Commission might exert its jurisdiction, doesn't always. Um, so, please. Um, so some of these ICOs, uh, Filecoin, I think included only sold to accredited investors. In my mind, that doesn't really change the definition of security <clears throat> or how we test or jurisdiction. So like, what, what is the benefit of only selling to accredited investors. Can, can I hold that? Because I got a slide on that, but it's a very good question. So, um, so uh, the Ernst and Young study, and I promise we'll get to it. So one year later, this is they looked at the top 141 ICOs of 2017. Um, I haven't looked at the whole list, but I think they they pretty much got it, the top end. 86% are trading below listed price as of September 30th. This does not take into consideration the last week, but the number would go up. 86% nine months later. 30% have lost substantially all their value. They're not necessarily scams and frauds, but it's interesting to compare that to Christian Catalini's 25% scam or fraud number. But these are the top 141 in size. These aren't the kind of the small riffraff size. Um, Collectively, the portfolio is down 66%. I didn't go back to compare what that would be versus Bitcoin, because some of these were issued in October, some December. But collectively, if you invested in the port, it's not January 1st to September 30th. It's from investment date. And only 13% have working products, and 16% have prototypes. Another interesting thing is the 13% that have working products, which is about 25 of these. Is that right? Roughly? Yeah, about 25 or so, 20 to 25. Seven of them have decided subsequent to launch to accept fiat currency to, to get the good or service. So literally, if you dig into the Ernst & Young report, they've chosen to take something else. And Hugo, back to your question about X, uh, RP, as I understand it, as I studied it, I might be mistaken, but 
X uh, rapid, you can actually use something other than XRP as the bridge currency to give it more, it has to be another crypto, but seven of 25 live projects that Ernst & Young followed has, have decided subsequently maybe to take a fiat currency for the good or service uh, as well. So that kind of gives you the sense, this was a note that, uh, about Catalini report and the status report as well. Um, what's going on on Ethereum? Just as a, this is a most recent report. Uh, I summarized something uh, from a site. These are um, <coughs> exchanges. There's 179 dApps. Th this is just looking at Ethereum. But there's only 25,000 uses a day for 179 sites. 17,000 in gambling, but it's exchanges, gambling, games, finance, fourth, and then you can go down. The other category, which only has 275 daily uh, uses, covers governance, identity, security, energy, insurance, and health. All six of those use cases, 218 dApps, which means they're all being used like zero or once a day. Um, this is, I believe I pulled this for the month of October. I think these, all these stats are, um, yeah, this was for the month of October. So it's, it's, it might be September, but it's all current information. Um, um, so what has the SEC done in this space? Well, they brought the Dow report in July of 2017. If you remember, the, this was the big 150, 160 million dollar uh, big ICO in 2016. A third of it was hacked. It led to the, the break in the Ethereum network between Ethereum Classic, the hard fork, and Ethereum. Dow actually shut down. It kind of it didn't take off. Um, and a year later, the SEC did not bring an enforcement action. They chose not to penalize anybody, but they laid out in pretty good detail as to why these things were securities. I don't think they had planned for what was going to happen next, but the ICO boom took off. I don't think because of the Dow report, but it's an interesting coincidence whether this kind of gave a bunch of lawyers and entrepreneurs a sense, all right, if I avoid doing what they did specifically, and the Dow, they actually paid part of the revenues to the token holders, and they gave a, a sense of voting rights. So it was all so security looking, because there were a form of, of participation in governance and a form of participation in profits, that everything took off. Then, then the SEC did two other things. One was kind of the RE, the RE coin complaint was a real fraudulent player. And the Munchie order in December last year, I read that in January, February, and I thought, well, that's pretty clear. And Jay Clayton, who runs the SEC then, and is setting congressional testimony in February that he hadn't met a ICO that he didn't think was a security. His, his words were a little different, but I thought between the Munchie order and, and Chairman Clayton's statement in February, he had really said it. But it wasn't quite enough. <laughs> it, it was, and the Munchie order again. They didn't assess penalties, but it was an offering. I can't remember the size, twenty to thirty million. They they knocked on Munchies. It was uh, Munchie, by the way. Does anybody know what the coin did? It's for restaurant reviews, Munchie food. Yeah, but they knocked on the Munchie uh, folks' door right as they were doing the offering, and they basically shut down the offering. Um, um, but then they did like a whole bunch of, the, there's five or six of these, almost all of which are really scammy, fraudy type things. I mean, I can't speak to each one, but they'd have some celebrity that was paid a lot of money to go out to hawk the coins and there wasn't much behind it and, and so forth. Um, asset freezes, filing complaints in courts, emergency court orders, one settlement. Um, it takes a long time to build a case, having 
have been the chairman of a smaller regulatory agency, I can tell you, it just takes a long time to build cases. It's not like three months. Uh, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's even three years. Um, um, but the last two, Air Fox and Paragon orders, were two offerings that were done 12 to 15 months ago. So a long time to bring it together, but they were settlements. And Paragon and Air Fox, which each raised, I don't know, 12 or 18 million each, or 15 or 18 million each, appeared on the surface to be more good faith actors. I, I can't speak, I don't, I don't know for sure, but they were really, first time the SEC has gotten penalties, first time they've gotten somebody to say, yes, if somebody wants their money back a year later, we'll, we'll do that. And yes, we'll come into compliance and we'll do offering documents. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what can you do? And I think, Zan, you asked this question, what can you do? And I'm gonna do it in two different charts, but the first one is called restricted offerings. And this is not a securities law class, this is just to give you a sense of what are the p potentials. A restricted offering, which comes out kind of 30 plus years ago at first, was the concept is, I'm not doing a public offering. I'm only selling these securities in a private placement. In my day, when I was on Wall Street, we called these private placements. But uh, a restricted offering, and there's three different ones. The, the most likely one is the 50C, 506C, which came out of a recent law passed in, in 2012 called the Jobs Act in Congress. Don't you love how we name our laws in the U.S., the JOBS Act? Um, uh, in credit, accredited investors only. And an accredited investor, and every jurisdiction is different. The concept is, is you have a little bit of net worth or a lot of net worth, depending upon your view about money, but you have enough net worth that you supposedly are sophisticated or accredited or you can have less protection under the securities law unless you need less information. Um, so uh, 506C says credit investors, if that's all it is, it's a restricted security. Restricted meaning you cannot sell it publicly for either six months or 12 months, depending upon how you structure these things. Um, and the big thing about all of the restricted offerings is you don't have to do one of those detailed information statements. So the SEC says, all right, if you keep it restricted, it's only accredited investors or the 506B accredited investors, but 35 people can be sophisticated rather than accredited. Please don't challenge me on the definitions of what's sophisticated and not accredited. It's basically you can show sophistication even if you don't have money. Accredited is about how much money you have. Sophisticated is knowledge but not money, roughly speaking. Um, and then there's a small thing for small offerings. Regulation D is what most of them, Telegram did a Regulation D on to let you know. Um, I think Falcoin did a Reg D offering. Generally speaking, it's like, quote, accredited investors meaning they have enough money. They have over, I can't remember, a million bucks or whatever the number is. Um, regulation A is offering statement. So you have to give a statement. You have to give something with the financials. Not many ICOs want to do a Reg A offering. But if you were doing a startup, if you're thinking about like you're in one of the wonderful uh, venture classes, FinTech ventures or other venture classes, you might consider doing a Reg A offering rather than a Reg D. The benefit of Reg A, Regulation A, is you can go to any investors. You don't have to only limit to accredited investors. So Regulation D, only accredited investors generally, with a little footnote about sophisticated investors. Regulation A, you've got to give them more information. You have to address some of that information asymmetry. There's two tiers, 20 million and 50 million. Um, the $50 million offering, you have ongoing reporting obligations. The 20 million, you just have to get yourself around doing something at the beginning. But how do you do financials for an ICO when there's, oh, I guess you just say you have no revenues, no income, 
et cetera. Uh, there's something very new called Regulation CF or crowdfunding. Unless you're raising less than a million dollars, you wouldn't put it on your list. So almost no initial coin offerings are looking at Reg CF. They're basically looking mostly at the what we used to call, you know, private placements or or restricted offerings, Regulation D. That's where most of them are. Um, uh, and you have to use good faith efforts to make sure that every one of your investors is in fact an accredited investor. And that's where it is. Questions? Do all of these regulation, D, A, and C, F, um, entail KYC and AML? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, do you have to do know your customer uh, and, and anti-money laundering? And the answer is yes, because over the last couple of decades, what's happened is finance ministries around the globe and this is not just here in the US, have kind of layered on top of securities laws, hey, we need your help here because there's this public policy goal of making sure that you can't money launder. Um, so yes, but in varying degrees. So in the Regulation D requirements, you have to make the good faith efforts when you do the initial sale and purportedly it's restricted and it's not supposed to be resold for either six or 12 months. But on the resale, the issuer doesn't have the same obligations. Whereas some of the others, you have more continuing obligations on the resale. So I think that some have tried to get around this and doing a Reg D offering and then said, can I get some crypto exchange to list this ICO? And I'm gonna turn a blind eye. I think it's bad legal advice they're taking, but turn a blind eye as to where it gets sold on that. I wouldn't recommend it, but I think some are doing that on the resale and not maybe doing KYC or AML on the resale. Or at least that's what some tell me. Please. I've heard some like crypto folks argue that you know the definition of the credit investor is you know not particularly relevant in this ICO space and actually you know having investable assets doesn't make you well placed to understand you know whether an ICO is a good product and I'm actually having technical skills being able to read a white paper is a more relevant sort of qualification to allow you to invest. And that by having these regulations in a, in a way you're restricting access and that promotes inequality that only rich people are getting these investment opportunities. So I've heard crypto people make this argument. So I guess what, what would your response to that be? And, and I'll hear your, your classmates' response. Yeah, I would say that um, rich people don't know how, how to handle money necessarily anyway. So <laughs> there isn't a direct correlation between having wealth and knowing how to use it. The law exists the way it does because of diversification and because of asset allocation theory and the idea that people don't understand that. And I think that even if you have technical expertise in crypto, you may not understand asset allocation theory and be able to balance what you need when. And basically, the, the law is set up such that you can lose all of that. And even if you're very savvy, you can be very savvy and still be wrong, and you've lost more than you own, and that wouldn't be okay. So I think from the government's perspective, it is what it is. I'm not, I would just respond to say that I don't think it's the government's role to police that. So can you speak up? I was just gonna, I think both the points are right. I just don't think, it's my opinion that it's not the government's role to decide that you don't get to invest in something that you believe in or work on because you don't, you may not understand portfolio theory uh, just because you don't have, you know, a two year track record of making $200,000 a year. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a very good uh, question. And there's this public policy debate as to if you have a belief that investor protection helps promote markets and investor protection uh, is about addressing some information asymmetries and protecting against fraud and, and bad actors. Uh, do you tier it? Now in the US, we've decided on some multiple decade, multiple Republicans and Democrats alike, somehow we've come to a tiered system, meaning that there's more investor protection, more rules and regulations, for what's usually called the retail public, um, than some tiering of usually higher net worth individuals, this term accredited investor. 
And that tiering, you could come to a point of view that we shouldn't have any tiering, that everybody should have the same protections and it should be maybe somewhere in the middle of the two, or you might be more pro-protection or less pro-protection. But we have come to a place in the US over multiple decades of this tiering where the, quote, accredited investors get a little less. They, they, they're allowed to risk their capital with less information. Um, that's, in, that's in essence what happens in, in a system. And Congress even pressed harder because the Regulation D, restricted offerings, the 506C, was added in this thing called the Jobs Act in 2012. It was like a, um, uh, some of the politics behind it was a venture capital space and a lot of entrepreneurial space uh, were saying, we'd like a less restrictive, less regulated, restricted offering of exemption. Remember, these are all called exempt security offerings. They're exempt from the traditional rules. Um, and uh, that there was a coalition that came together in Congress with the support of President Obama, um, actually not with the support of the head of his Securities and Exchange Commission. Mary Shapiro at the time was not in favor of some of this. There was an interesting um, um, uh, event in 2012. Uh, but I think 506C, if I remember, was either expanded or was added to say, well, if it's accredited investors, there'll be no limitation on general solicitation. If you see 506B, traditionally there was a limitation on general solicitation, and the thought was in 2012, no, with the internet, we should be able to, and, and, and um, crowdsourcing had started, and Kickstarter, and GoFundMe had started, so maybe we can have, quote, general solicitation if it's only accredited investors. So it was a bit of a compromise, legislative and, and policy compromise, but you could take the other side and said everybody should have the same um, one way or the other. But if you were, whether you're thinking about blockchain or you're thinking about all the other wonderful things you're thinking about as startups, these are your kind of three main ways and really probably Regulation D and Regulation A more than the small million. Um, I have high hopes for all of you that you'll be raising more than a million dollars in your startups. Um, this is just, a, this is a much more detailed, I'm not gonna go through it, but it's gonna be in Canvas. I decided to throw it in the slide deck so you have it, but this really is a much more detailed uh, review of, of uh, the crowd check put together, and I thought it was a good review of all these. So what do I think the path forward is? And then we'll wrap. Um, uh, so I think we're gonna to continue to see high failure rates that, um, Something like 3,000 ICOs have raised some bits of money. I mean, some of them only raised $200,000, but you can only find about 700 or 800 of them listed on various websites if you want to see where they're traded. But there's probably more than 700 that are still around. But I think you're going to continue to see high failure rates like the Ernst & Young study showed. I think it's going to lead to a further decline in funding totals. We've already seen that we were running one and a half to $3 billion a month earlier this year, and now we're less than a billion dollars a month. But I think high failure rates will probably lead to lower funding totals. Um, uh, this is just Gensler's view. Pre predicting markets is always a treacherous thing to do. Um, um, I think that there'll be an increased number of enforcement cases in private litigation. We've seen only 11 or 12 actually at the SEC. They, these cases are hard to put together. They take a long time, a lot of evidence and a lot of paper trails to put together and so forth. And, and even a civil law enforcement agency like the SEC, I don't know their head count right now, the whole agency might be about 4,000 people. Their enforcement arm might be 1,000 people. They can't dedicate. <clears throat> You know, what are they dedicating to this? Uh, I don't know the number. It's not a public figure, but could it be 50 or 100 people at most to this whole world, which probably has hundreds of frauds and scams and, and a couple thousand of unregistered, basically illegal offerings? So, you, you can't, so 
But I do think the enforcement actions will pick up and you'll see more and, and also private litigation, which is also what you have in the XRP case, but you, you have it in other cases as well. I think regulators and courts will bring greater clarity to the security definition. At some point in time, things like XRP will decide it. It might be decided it's not a security, you know, but, you know, that, but I think that's going to roll out over the next 18 to 36 months. It's not like the next three weeks or six weeks, but um, I think that even the Securities and Exchange Commission will speak more definitively than uh, Bill Hinman's uh, speech he gave in, oh, was it June? Yeah, June. That was one of the readings, right? Uh, Director Hinman's. I like that he used my name in the speech, the, the title. He was talking about Gary Indiana, though. Um, but I do think just like what happened with Air Fox uh, and Paragon, more ICOs will be brought into compliance, either by registering in the U.S. under Reg D or maybe Regulation A, or they'll just come into compliance even if they didn't earlier come into compliance. Um, I think that the early tokens uh, will be tested as some platforms become functional. Most will fail. Most will we'll never hear from. But what happens when Filecoin actually, they raised a quarter of a billion dollars. Let's, let's at least for now presume they will become functional sometime in 2019 or Telegram. It will be interesting to see what the test of these large cap ICOs are. We'll learn from that. I also think markets will better differentiate viability. They'll go through, when do you need an append-only log, <laughs> consensus among multiple parties, and a native token on a distributed ledger. Um, uh, that wasn't happening probably enough in late 2017 and early 2018. I don't think they had to take this class, even though we'll put it out live and people will be able to see it. But I think markets will start to differentiate viability of ICO use cases a little better than they have the last 12 months. Um, so any questions? Eric? Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of startups we've been uh, checking out. They're going through a new approach. There's actually a lot of venture capital firms that are doing a financing stage pre-ICO to help the startup build uh, the actual network. And in that case, when they go post-ICO, the ICO, the, you could argue that they, that help building the network before the ICO can actually make them fail the how we test because there's no, in, in a sense, you have a network, a decentralized arrangement that you don't have the single enterprise. So, I think, Eric, you're raising two questions. Is there ways to stage your financing to, to help build a network uh, just as a pure money and finance? And secondly, what is the regulatory implication? Because I think it's two, two part. Uh, I think uh, like in any form of venture, you might stage your financing. And in this case, sort of address the network uh, possibility before you do the, the, the regulatory. And it may be enough. I mean, the, the US Securities and Exchange Commission in the uh, Hinman speech sort of said, you could be sufficiently decentralized as Ethereum. They, they in essence, had some regulatory forbearance. And there's a key sentence in that speech as to, I think the words were, regardless of what Ethereum might have been in 2014. Like, like Hinman kind of pushed that to the side, said, I'm not going to address that question implicitly, but it's sufficiently decentralized. That's the debate that's going on now between a bunch of venture firms and the SEC. When are you sufficiently decentralized? And so that form that you just mentioned might uh, uh, get us there, might. I don't know. Uh, did you have one last question? And then we're going to... Uh, Maybe just on the second point about likely further decline in funding total, so obviously agree. Is there any research? It's just, just a prediction. Yeah. I'll bet on it. Um, how much of the ICO funding was crypto to fiat to crypto? <laughs> People selling appreciated bitcoins. And it's ter ter terrific question. Almost uh, all ICOs are priced crypto to crypto. 
So if you look at whether the initial ones all the way back when Ethereum was priced vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin or the most recent EOS that raised 4.2 billion, their actual pricing mechanism, I'm not familiar with any of the price versus fiat. Like their pricing mechanism right in their uh, auction or offering. It's almost always crypto to crypto, but somebody might be funding it fiat to crypto. But I think to answer your question, you should assume 99% or the actual exchange is crypto to crypto. So, I mean, just the decline in the price of Ethereum, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash almost has to. It has to, it has to put pressure on it, but I also think the decline, it is likely that the decline in the ICO market has put price pressure downward on Ethereum for sure. And you know, so Ethereum was the second most valued uh, crypto, and now it's third, and it's had more price decline than Bitcoin or XRP. I think part of that narrative, part of that story is the decline in ICO space is likely to put a little decline on that.